Americans spent 16 hours a year watching drug ads, and that's about 100 times the, the amount of time that they spend with a doctor. I think it's kind of interesting. You know, the companies are spending $150 million on, on marketing, and D.C. is spending $50 million on benefits. I'm not sure where the return on investment is. The profitability of antipsychotics has meant a lot more interest in um, psychotic people to test the drugs. These are very unpleasant drugs to take. It's really hard to get healthy volunteers to take them for three or four weeks. And so trial sites have been out on the streets looking for subjects with a history of psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I've, uh, since January, I've made uh, two visits to Philadelphia, just talking to people in recovery houses and homeless shelters, and I've hardly found a single uh, shelter where this practice is unfamiliar. We had a kid actually come in last week, he's on five different medicines. Amitriptyline, flu uh, fluoxetine, Prozac. Um, I don't know why he's on two antidepressants, but he is. Uh, he's on Seroquel, he's on, uh, he's on Clonidine, and he's on um, Atomoxetine. Uh, he's eight. I heard the story about a kidney donor in whom a kidney was removed and two non-locking clips had been used during the operation to close the very short stump of artery that was left after the kidney was removed. The patient left the operating room with the surgeon feeling that the patient was safe and very shortly thereafter, within a few hours, the patient suddenly bled to death. Uh, this picture is a nursing home in Georgia that we shut down earlier this year. In what's sadly not an isolated scheme, the owner took the money meant for buying food and medicines and for making payroll for staff and used it to buy things for himself. Now we've seen homes, like the one in the picture, where actually the staff rally together and even though their employer might not be making payroll and not buying food and medicines, they take their own money and they buy basic food for the residents. Meanwhile, the nursing home operator who was receiving the Medicare and Medicaid money uh, bought several vacation homes for himself and luxury cars for himself, and he also bought a million-dollar house for his ex-wife. When patients are going through these CT scans, do they have any idea what dose they're getting and if it's outside of these ranges? So the knowledge about radiation dose is pretty consistent. So the doctor or healthcare provider who ordered the study, the radiologist who protocoled the study, the technologist who does the study, and the patient have equal knowledge about the dose, and that's nothing. <laughs> Very consistent. And these are surveys of doctors who order CTs or do the CTs. So the knowledge base is hard. It's overwhelming. And, so I, I don't want to pick on ED docs, but if you ask ED docs, probably 30% of them don't know that CT scans use radiation. So it's really, it's real, and these are studies. These are not my, so it's, so it's a huge issue. Well, that was my question about what you see as trends in criminally prosecuting individual executives, sort of past, present, and future. Where are we at on sending some of these guys to jail? I was wondering if we could have a little more discussion about how, why we can't arrest executives. There is one recent case where we ended up not excluding a, um, a chief executive uh, recently, and it was because we couldn't prove that he was actually responsible, that, that it was coming from the top down, that he was actually directing the people below him, directing the people below him. And that's a defense that... Um, drug companies often use for off-label promotion, they say, well, the sales reps are acting on their own. So one of the things that we can do is, the best thing is when we have someone on the inside that gives us a smoking gun and shows us the training where they taught the sales rep to present this. They taught, they've seen ones where they teach the sales rep how to uh, solicit unsolicited questions about off-label use. Um, but when we don't have that, we can look at the compensation structure. We can look at, are they rewarding the um, sales reps for off-label use. I, I personally think that the first time a CEO or someone high up in one of the pharmaceutical companies is criminally indicted for repeated uh, abuses of the off-label rules of the, of the government, of the federal government, that'll be the beginning of the end of those practices. Even though state legislators like myself, I mean, pharm pharma could very well come in and spend outside, unlimited now, outside money to defeat me in the next election, the fact is, is we have so many of us running in Maine, and we don't have a big pharmaceutical or medical device 
uh, industry, that's a great place to go to, to start new um, laws or to uh, get some oversight hearings, say in a state legislature, that would look at some of these issues. There's nothing stopping you, even if you don't have the regular authority uh, to, to license a medical device, uh, and that's at the federal level. There's nothing to stop you from having an oversight hearing at the state level about why is our state Medicaid paying for this device, which has had all these problems all over the world. When I first started working on this whole non-inferiority issue, I was told by loads of people at FDA and the drug companies, it's too complicated for people to understand. I don't think telling people that you're evaluating how much worse your drug is is that difficult for people to understand. You don't want people to know about it, but that doesn't mean people can't understand it. And that means we need to be better consumers of health care. Even at the Supreme Court level, you can see that it was very hard for people to get a real grip on where the data was, what was being used, why you should care, why pharmaceutical companies care so much. And that, I think that being able to explain to people about how this data matters, how it affects the health care they get, and why they should care that their doctor is being marketed to with this data that is about them and about their care to affect the treatment they get. It should matter to people. I might say that another tool that might be useful would be if we would terminate for some time or suspend, which is not done enough, the company's access to Medicare and Medicaid funding when they're found guilty of these violations. Believe me, that is the death penalty for any of these medical device or drug companies. That is the death penalty. They're all making most of their money from Medicare and Medicaid. So if we want to enforce the law, we've got to threaten and carry out those threats and make an example of somebody who comes back to the prosecution negotiating table once too often. That's, again, just my personal view and not a committee position.